topic is, of course, fluid forming inversion. And uh, my feeling is fluid forming inversion started to be a tool for exploration seismology. And then now it's getting to be a popular tool for uh, regional seismology studies as well. So I'm giving you an example of recent studies in the exploration seismology where you can <coughs> see the horizontal extent is covering like you know, 16 kilometers and the vert vertical is around 10 kilometers. And this is a beautiful result of velocity model in color uh, on top of the migration image using that velocity model. And what's remarkable about this result, uh, which come out first at the SED annual meeting in 2017, is that they were able to resolve the salt body or update the salt model such that it, it uh, helped a lot in the subsalt imaging for the first time in the field. Um, so this the specialty of this remarkable success is that uh, in this acquisition is a ocean bottom node acquisition and the largest offset is more than 30 kilometers. And the minimum frequency they had was 1.5 hertz. So that was very low frequency and very long offset. That has made the imaging of 10 kilometers in depth uh, possible. And as I said, this tool of full wheel forming inversion that in comparison to conventional travel time tomography has become more and more popular for global or regional seismologists as well. So this is an example where the Nankai 12 was studied by a similar type of seismic acquisition, which is also ocean bottom node that are displayed, uh, deployed all the way across. And as you can see, the sources are really, really long. The maximum offset here is more than 60 kilometers with the minimum frequency at 1.5 hertz. So similar technique, similar technique in acquisition and processing has been applied to study the regional geology that you will be able to understand the fault <coughs> zones so much better than before. So I would say with the large number of nodes that becomes more and more available for earthquake seismologists or um, you know, regional seismologists, this type of technique of fluid forming inversion has become more and more popular everywhere. However, we also see what, what I would call spectacular failures. And uh, well, this, this figure is purpose purposefully blurred, such that you will see, well, this is the real model that we are looking for. Then starting from a very smooth background, you can end up with all kinds of models. And I would, see, I would say these ones are not very successful in terms of resolving the geology, in terms of explaining the kinematics mm -hmm. of of the wave field. So what we are seeing is that full form, full wave form inversion is so powerful that we'll be, give, be able to provide you with a very high spatial resolution velocity model that you can use for direct uh, geological interpretation. But on the other hand, there are so many challenges with respect to it. So let me il illustrate the challenge using this very simple figure. Um, this is the objective function for full forming inversion. Many people, you know, all of you probably know that. So we model the waveform as a function of the velocity that would work, the model that we are interested in. It can be acoustic velocity, elastic velocity, and isotropy, and so on and so forth. Then we match that with the measured data. Then if I use a simple 1D velocity model, that velocity error is plotted on the horizontal axis, then the number that comes out of this objective function on the vertical axis at high frequencies that I'm talking about at four hertz, you will see a oscillation in the objective function that shows this objective function is non-convex and you are very uh, susceptible to local minima. So all the successful cases are the cases where you start close enough in the 
main basin of contraction, then using <coughs> a gradient descent method. By the way, that's almost the only method that we can use here because of the amount of data that you are dealing with and the large country computation that you have to use in order to extrapolate the wave fields and so on. So use a gradient descent method and li li iterative linearization, you will be able to arrive at the global minimum. So all the successful cases falls into that global minimum and uh, you, know, you will get uh, a very good understanding of the subsurface. However, if you start far out, which is, well, maybe not so far out, but just outside of the basin of contraction, then your gradient descent will inevitably get you at the local minimum and stuck right there. So you will not be able to resolve a good subsurface model. And the slide on the slide before, you have seen all different kinds of local minima that you can get into, such that your model is not the same as the true. And I would like to point it out that later in the talk as well, to give you examples, sometimes in the field, it's very difficult to tell whether you are stuck in the local minima or not because you don't know the real answer. So we will see examples of that. So in academic research of FWI, many people have devoted their effort in terms of um, solving this non-convexity or convexifying the fully forming inversion objective function. So there are different remedies. The first category would be let's design a smarter objective function. So the, the slide uh, before the equation was a L2 measure between the modeled data with the, uh, with the observed data, but then that's highly non-convex. Non People have proposed to use wave equation tomography where travel time is picked to, to uh, evaluate the objective function, then warping, you know, and then world system metric, and now it's called optimal, optical, optimal transport. So all kinds of these objective functions that are used to evaluate the difference between the model data and the observed data. And this is an example that I extracted from Beck and Laurent. And they was showing that in order to directly match the dotted amplitude, with the solid amplitude, you should be matching the shift between the travel time shift between these two. Mm -hmm. And that is a more stable measure, a more convex measure of the objective function. But there are a lot of complexities. For example, when you have multiple arrivals coming in in a complex geometry, you will have a hard time finding, deciding which event you would like to match over. Okay, so ambiguities such a, as these would also lead you to uh, erroneous models. So the second uh, group of remedies goes to what I call extended model space. So when you have a model space where your objective function is non-convex, if you are able to extend that model space to wider, then you have a chance to uh, convexify it. So this kind of started way earlier. Well, I should have cited an earlier paper from Bill Symes on differential semblance optimization. And then it has gone to various flavors where you can add the whole wheel field or whole velocity as the extended model or the source or the whole wheel field. And the, the whole idea is that initially we have this objective function where you only have the physical model over there. Now you can extend the object function to have an extended model such that <coughs> this data matching is better preserved. Then of course, uh, a lot of the times this model is non-physical where it's too big, then you need to apply constraints such that you either remove this uh, extended model eventually after iterations or impose physical meanings on that. So the problem of model extension is that it will increase a lot more country computation and it will increase a lot more memory cost while you are doing this. And the, and the algorithm to choose how to progressively 
loosen the constraint on the extended model as iteration goes on is also very tricky. Okay. Then the third one is people have observed that in FWI there are uh, tomographic components and there's that means the low wave number component can come in and uh, th then people have designed, try to design different kind of filters to enhance the low frequency tomographic component compared to the reflection component. So this is one of the example where Peter Mora back in 1989 has proposed that even for reflection geometry this velocity anomaly is transmitted by the reflections coming from this reflector. So by utilizing the updates that is going in up and down direction, you will be able to filter out the low, low wave number information that's needed for your FWI. So this kind of method works well, again, in the close to the basin of contraction. If you are too far out, this, this kind of method also suffer from cyclescaping. And I will show you examples of that. And while I was here, um, the project that I worked with Laurent, and there was a continuation with Hong Yu, oh, is that the ultimate uh, recipe for overcome non-convexity is to, to have low frequencies, which are very expensive to acquire in the field. And then if you are working with legacy data set, you wouldn't have these low frequencies. So people have proposed different methods to create low frequencies from existing data. I'm just showing you this, this <coughs> example from uh, our paper. This was the recorded data from 7 to 40 hertz. Then we were able to extract the atomic event from here and extrapolate the frequency to 0.5 to 5 hertz. Mm -hmm. And then this will be ultimately used to initialize FWI. Then I can criticize on um, our work, which is, uh, it works very well at near offset where the events are well separated. Well, you go to far offsets when events are merging towards each other and crossing each other, then this event separation uh, technique doesn't work very well anymore. So I guess that uh, motivates Hong Yu <coughs> and Laurent to explore the avenue of using machine learning to do this automatic extraction. And I know Zhilong has a paper that's going to come out, have a holistic evaluation of all these FWI methods, and uh, I would encourage you to stay tuned to him for the results that he has to present. So today I would like to you know, introduce a different way of thinking of approaching these this problem. So if we start from there with a non-convex problem, then the ultimate, another ultimate goal at high frequency is why don't we sample the model space? If we are, if we can afford to sample the model space in, in a Monte Carlo type of way, then we can evaluate these models and we will be able to find the, the global minimum. So that's kind of the global op optimization method. And the, the, the challenge is that, um, well actually, the challenge is that the computational cost is too big for the type of forward modeling that, that we are doing. But recently, there's this algorithm that was proposed uh, from the math community. It's called gradient sampling algorithm. The idea is that conventionally you would start from this point in the model space, compute a single gradient, then go along that direction. But what you can do is you can actually sample the area around that model. And then after sampling, you compute the gradients around, well, for each point in this space and do a smart average. <coughs> then the average or the weighted gradient will be a better direction for you to go. So with this, oops, with this you, you have an algorithm that is supporting the sampling only in the region that you are looking at at the moment. And it limits the sampling space, but also gives you, give you the flexibility of exploring other directions. And by a smart combination, this direction will be better than the original grad gradient direction. So if we wanted to implement this for full form inversion, 
Uh, what I'm showing you here is the gradient calculation formula, which is just simply multiplying my source wheel field with the receiver wheel field and uh, weighted with the current model. So this is the conventional ca calculation. It scales with the number of shocks you have. And if we want to do the gradient sampling, that means for the number of models we want to, to sample on, we will have so many uh, forward problem to solve and backward problem to solve. So these are really, really expensive. And that, well, that is not to, uh, not adding this step where all the gradients are need to be added together to form a smart gradient. And the weights here have this constraint, <coughs> constrained by this condition that the summation of all the weights has to be one. And, and in order to get that, you need to solve another convex optimization which involves more wheel field propagation. So we want to use this, but this is too expensive for us to use. Then what, what we want to do is, what the question we ask is that, can we approximate these wheel fields without doing wave equation solves? Okay. So the answer is probably yes, we can, solve, we can approximate using uh, using the current wave field. So let me show you the uh, very simple equations in a 1D ge geometry. I have a plane wave coming from this direction. It propagates to the forward x. Then at this location x1, there is a medium change from slowness 0 to slowness 1. And because of this interface, I have two kind of scattering. Of the forward scattering going still in the positive x direction and backward scattering going the opposite direction. So it's very simple math that I would just say the source wheel field represented in the uh, frequency and space domain is something like this. And uh, I can work out the equations for backward scattered wheel field, which is a function that uh, at the reflection location and also the location that I'm right at. And then the similarly, I can work out the equation for the forward scattered wheel field. So really nothing fancy, but in 1D, very, very easy to understand. Now I'm going to perturb the velocity in the first layer by saying I, I have inaccuracy. I want to sample a velocity that is in the vicinity of this particular slowness. And, and as you can tell, if I just change S0 to S0 plus delta S, it's a very simple algebra to do. So that's what I'm doing. And eventually, you will, you will see that by replacing S0 by S0 plus delta S, you are essentially shifting the wheel field by a small space. So it's very, very intuitive, right? So when you change the velocity, you change the location of your wheel field. It's, it's physically really, really intuitive. What is not quite intuitive, um, but revealed very well from the equations is that if you are looking at the backward scattered wheel field, you are to shift the wheel field in the negative direction that you would shift the forward Whereas if you were shifting the forward scatter wheel field, the direction is the same. Okay. So if you sit down and think about these statements, they are also intuitive because when you want to reflect a wheel field, this one would become you know, shorter if the slowness is larger. Okay. So this is kind of where we ended up uh, concluding is that now I'm going to assume, so I'm just representing the shifts using HS, meaning source, uh, the shift in backward propagation, the shift in the forward propagation, or backward scattering and forward scattering. So now I'm going to make some assumptions. I say the layer boundaries are densely distributed everywhere in the medium, and forward and backward scattering occur at every location. Then I'm just going to say x1 equals x, and uh, S0 is S1, and it's a continuous function of, of the space. So with that, I'm going to say all of the shifts are the same. It's proportional to the velocity change or slowness change in the medium, and also how far you have propagated 
away from the source. So this is the key conclusion of this study where if we want to approximate wheel fields <coughs> by sampling, then it's, if we are doing random sampling, then we just need to do random sp space shifts. And to approximate the sampled forward scattering wheel field, you need to shift the source and receiver in the same direction. If you want to approximate this backward scattering wheel field, you shift these two wheel fields in two different directions. Is, yeah. is this a retail approximation type? Or a, I mean, a born approximation or retail? Well, I, it's more like retail, yes. Okay. So I, I'm perturbing everything in the face. In the face, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, that, that approximation here, this approximation is on the amplitude. So I'm assuming by perturbing the wheel field, I'm not changing the amplitude too much. Okay, so that is sort of what we talk about. Yeah, it's right off. So with this, well, exactly what, as you have pointed out, uh, what we can do is now we can efficiently sample the, the model space just by shifting my source and receiver view field. And depending on the problem I'm solving, if, if I'm solving the forward scattering problem, that is most of the case for FWI, then I will shift them in the same direction, meaning if this is minus, I will use minus there. Then if I'm, if I'm solving an imaging problem, that's a reflection problem, then I will use them in two different directions. That will be, this is minus, that will be plus. So when you look at this, for the reflection problem, that is what people usually say that is called subsurface offset. But now we give that a different meaning, which is you know, the sampled velocity field that reflected in the, um, in the wheel field itself. And there is another approximation <coughs> happened here. Not only we removed all the wheel field uh, calculation, but also we removed this, this coefficient alpha. So to be honest, the reason is just I don't have a better way. I don't have a good way of computing that without, without doing uh, you know, wave field extrapolation. So the idea is, well, I'm extrapolating the wave field as a function of time. Then at each time, I just choose a random shift. So that means at each time, I'm sort of sampling a different velocity model. Then I'm stacking all the contribution together for each time step I'm extrapolating then, well, I sort of say alpha, well, n equals to one and alpha equals to one as well. So that's kind of my hand wavy way of dealing with that nasty coefficients that I don't know how to, how to solve. So I'm gonna show you a very simple algorithm. Anyone has a FWI algorithm, can take it and modify. Within like two minutes, you will get this algorithm. So what happens is from t equals to zero to the maximum time, compute forward wheel field, compute backward wheel field. Then when you're calculating the gradient, depending on the problem you are solving, if it's FWI, use the same direction. If it's in imaging, use the different direction. Then, well, do your gradient preconditioning, you know, weighting or masking, whatever you have been doing, and then do the line search and iterate. So this is an algorithm that is closest to the conventional FWI as possible. And uh, I will, and this is, you know, somewhat coming from the sampling point of view. Okay. And I've talked about this with Laurent and he said, <laughs> <laughs> And I talked about it with John, for sure, and he said that. And, uh, and I was like, I agree. Well, the reason I talked about it is trying to recruit help from mathematicians and try to ask them to help me justify my algorithm. <laughs> Well, which apparently failed, but, uh, <laughs> but what I, I'm going to show you with my numerical case studies is that, 
Well, yeah, it seems to be a heuristic, but it seems to be always working better than conventional FWI. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, and this is just nothing more expensive than that, and two lines into your code, maybe you should just implement that. Okay, so let me show you the numerical examples. Well, before that, let me tell you my strategy of doing inversion. So I would start very aggressively from a half space model. And that is as far as you can be from the true. Then at the low frequencies, I'm going to choose two strategies. One is conventional FWI. Then we call our algorithm random space shift FWI. So the result of this low frequency uh, inversion will become the initial models for conventional frequency sweep from the lowest frequency that we have to the highest frequency. Then the final state final solution, I will denote them as you know, very long acronyms, mm -hmm. so <laughs> you will know. <laughs> it will be obvious which one is our method, hopefully, in the, <laughs> in the uh, result. The, the, frequent, uh, not that yeah. the, the frequency suite means so that you uh, invert yeah. each frequency separately? Right. So, okay, not exactly, but <coughs> all the inversion is down in time domain. So that means we would just filter the waveform within a narrow frequency band, and then starting from the low frequency band, gradually increasing to the high frequency band. And that's, uh, that's what we call frequency sweep in this context. So when you get to the high, does it still fit the low? Does the low yeah. still yeah. optimize yeah, because the low? Yeah, we, we increase the band rather than, oh, rather than moving to a high frequency band. Gotcha. So I'm going to show you three case studies. Uh, the first, first two is more like, you know, as a algorithm test, you have to do this. Uh, slow Gaussian anomaly, and I tested, uh, well, we tested really in the transmission geometry. And the second one is slow layered velocity. And I call it a pure reflection geometry just because the second layer is slower than the first layer, so you wouldn't get the refractions, you wouldn't get the diving waves. And then the last one is a scaled BP salt model, and uh, I know I'm going to get a lot of criticism from there. <laughs> Maybe from all. So, <laughs> so, well, let me start it. Oh, by the way, I want to emphasize, uh, we choose the perturbation in the slow direction just because it's a more challenging problem to solve because waves tend to go through the fast layer. And we, all, we tested all of them with fast, and they all work. Okay, So let's go to the slow Gaussian anomaly case. This is the true velocity with a very low Gaussian anomaly here. So that velocity is probably 2100 meters per second, whereas the background is uh, 3000 meters per second. So the perturbation there is really large, although it's kind of smooth from the, from the edge to the center. The initial model is just homogeneous. And this case, uh, as I said, is a transmission case. There are sources, I think, not too many, I can't remember. But there are much more, like 200 receivers down there. So it's a pure transmission case. Let me show you the data that you are expecting. So I call this measured, so in fact it's synthetic data on the true model. I call it measured <coughs> data. Then this is the data that you would get from the initial model. And that one is the data residual. Okay. So if you look at this, uh, well how much what we call cycloscape, that means how much phase difference between this, the first arrival, and that, that is probably more than half a cycle. This, uh, you know, what you see here, it's not more than a cycle because it's not really doing a, uh, a, a double derivative or you are not, show, you are not seeing a, uh, a second side loop coming in, but this is probably ha half a cycle over there. But what really challenging is this one that doesn't show up in the initial model at all. Okay, so if we take, well, this is the initial data residue, then we put it into the two algorithms. On the left, you have the conventional FWI gradient, 
which is the negative update that you look for. So what you see, this it's normalized because we have to do a line search anyway. And what you see is in the center, conventional FWI is suggesting you to increase the yeah, to increase the velocity, is that right? Sorry, I think I plotted wrong. Um, so it should be, well, I think this is probably just the update already. So this is, you know, the conventional is suggesting you to increase the velocity in the center, whereas our algorithm tell you this should be a slower, slower uh, velocity area. So if you... It depends on the sign of the residual. There's nothing wrong with a negative gradient. It's because you might have a negative residual. Yeah. Well, it depends. So because in this high dimensional space, that there are so many ways that you can go yeah. to decrease your objective function. Yes. And this is one of the ways that will lead you to a wrong model. But it will decrease your objective function, at least initially. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's... But, and this is also another way to, to go down that will decrease your objective function, but hopefully take you further compared to this one. Yeah. So mm -hmm. both would decrease the residual. B both will decrease the objective function. Okay. It's just a different path that you have to go through in the, in the high dimensional space. Then this is, I think, after 200 iterations, in the lowest frequency band that we have is 5 to, to 10 hertz. And on the left, you started to see this very high wave number feature coming in. And uh, on the right, you see a very smooth update that focuses on the center and tells you that um, this, this is uh, lower than the background of three kilometers per second. Okay, and if we take this through all the frequency sweep, this is the final result. So on the left, is it obvious? that our method. <laughs> yeah, so this clearly outperforms that and in terms of resolving the model, of course. But then, let's look at the data. Okay. This is the measured data. This is the model data from the conventional FWI. And that is the model data using our you know, random space shift. So what you see is conventional FWI really tried hard to fit this bow tie feature in the data. And uh, it probably has done an OK job if you only look at these features. Right? But then let's look at the data residue. I'm going to subtract this from that and that mm -hmm. from this as well. So there you go. What you see is that in order to create this bow tie shape using conventional FWI, it has created two more events that wasn't there. And that's, what, that's where the objective function was decreasing at initially, but it got stuck eventually because there's no way that these two events can be removed. Whereas on the other side, you see it's very nicely removed and there's no other event has been created. And uh, by the way, these events are created by the high wave number features that you saw in the model. Is this a noiseless case? It's noiseless, yes. So We're if you kept iterating, you eventually would have gotten to the correct answer? Sorry, if I... If you kept iterating, you would have eventually yeah, gotten to yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we kept iteration to 200 at each frequency. And uh, uh, my postdoc has run it up to 1,000. Then yes, you can, in this case, go make the residual much deeper, much smaller. Elita? Yeah. Could you go back to the uh, results? For the, the model? Yes. Okay. Uh, with your approach, it seemed like your anomaly got 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Oh, got thinned. Well, I wouldn't say that. It's just the aperture. This is a, this is a uh, transmission geometry. If you think about the rays, right? There are so many rays coming through in the center. Okay then there are rays going across, especially at the edge. So, so this reflects my ray density in, in my acquisition geometry. And you will see that in reflection case as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say this compared to the truest thin, but it's just compared to the top. Okay. First, give you a question. Yeah. Why there are two hyperbola in the mayor data? In the just wondering 
there's if, if it's transmission, it, it should be like uh, one. Well, there's second. something called caustics. So it's when the wave, uh, when your wave going through a local velocity anomaly, it the wave front bends. And they would. Uh, it's like how you were looking into a uh, a crystal, and uh, and you see images distorted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zhilong. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You have you yes. Yes. So how, the of the how is it chosen? Good question. Uh, we chose it depending on the wavelength that we are working with. So we chose it between the minus two lambda and plus two lambda in terms of wavelength, uh, which is a uniform distribution and uh, what else? And in this case, it was chosen in the horizontal direction. Could, could it be because of the length scale you chose that the effect is somehow canceling out the uh, Sort of noise in the, that the regular method has? Well, so when we look into this, you know, why it works, yeah. um, we thought, is this just another fancy smoothing in the, in the gradient? Because it looks like it. Yeah. And we tried, you know, we tried to smooth it using a, uh, a rectangular function with random coefficients on top of one that didn't work, well, that didn't perform as well as this one, or not even close to, to this one. Um, so really, uh, I would like to recruit some mathematicians to help me figure out why it's working. I have some, uh, <laughs> uh, I have some speculations that we'll give towards the end, but I really have a hard time and, uh, you know, pinpoint why it works so well. And uh, I will show you another example where it worked really, really well, and I almost don't believe it. <laughs> um, and this is the case where it's a layered medium, and I have a slow velocity in that. And it's a notorious problem for tomography because you don't see that layer. And uh, uh, even for reflection, um, reflection uh, FWI is very, very difficult, as everyone knows. But uh, let me show you. So this is the true layer model. Uh, I believe this is, I think someone there, 2,800 meter per second. This is 18 meter per second. This is slightly faster, I think. Maybe, I can't remember what number that was. And, and this is the fastest, fastest layer, basically. Then, well, I cheated a little bit by knowing, by assuming that we know the near surface velocity because otherwise it's really, it's really bad. So for anyone who is working with land data, it's, which is me as well, so it's really challenging to, so in this case, we just assume we know the first layer, you know, that velocity, but then the rest would be a half space. And it's still a transmission problem? No, this is a reflection problem. Thanks okay. for reminding me of that. A reflection problem, and I kind of call it a pure reflection just because this velocity is lower and there's no refractions going on, even though this is like three kilometer and this is 1.5 kilometer. Okay. So gradients, conventional FWI, and our method. And, and why this happens is <coughs> really uh, not understand, not understood. And, and why, and we've tried all kinds of different initial model, you know, starting from three kilometer per second to um, 3.5 kilometer per second. And it seems this boundary would move up and down slightly, but there is a uniform update mm -hmm. just coming out of it. And there is the same kind of smoothing, which is very small patch, has been applied to two models. But um, other than that, we didn't do anything. And you said the, the random displacement is only horizontal. Oh, in this case, good question. In this case, it's vertical. Only Beca vertical. Yeah, because the reason being, now we are looking at reflections, and the transmission wave through this part is vertically going down for the source and also vertically going up for the reflections. So we shift the wheel field in the vertical direction in this case. Okay. Okay. And that's 
the gradient, and that's the inversion result at the lowest frequency. Again, it's 5 to 10 hertz. On the left, you see conventional FWI, which is basically highlighting you know, the, the boundaries. <coughs> and this is another boundary that is strong to show up. Then in order to fit the data, FWI has put in a lot of you know, artifacts in it. Whereas this is a clear update, very low wa wave number, and even with indications that this is a slower, well, smaller, uh, faster velocity, slower velocity, and faster velocity. So we did imaging using these two models. We we'll see is, of course, when you introduce high wave number in your velocity model, your image will be distorted. And uh, you see the boundaries, but they are not the same. Then on the right-hand side, just with the model before, you see these two layers. A third layer is there. It's just because the velocity contrast is low, so the amplitude of that re the reflection coefficient of that layer is low. And this is the final inversion result when we include all the frequencies starting from the model that you just saw. And the resolution of that layer is, again, something that I don't I have seen, I have not seen before, and I cannot explain. <laughs> Again, imaging results clearly, uh, in fact, the depth defi definition of these reflectors are also better resolved with the final model, and clearly your image is not improved from, from the conventional. Yes, Paul. I was wondering if we also tried like inverting five to six hertz or five to seven hertz, because like, if you're somehow smoothing your data, so you're saying if I narrow my frequency band, yeah. would that help? We didn't try that, but I would assume I would I wouldn't because really the five hertz cutoff is quite high. So we had a hard cutoff at five hertz. Um, I wouldn't imagine, but we can try. The dominant frequency is probably 10 hertz, yes, 10 hertz. Okay, so maybe 5 to 10 hertz is dominated by close to 10 hertz mm -hmm. frequencies. Mm -hmm. And if you're like smoothing your gradient, you're somehow boosting energy close to 5 hertz. Okay. So I'm just guessing. Yeah, well in this case we haven't observed, you know, FWI, However long we iterate wouldn't converge, but I will, I will show you an example later on the BP model actually, well on the soft body model, uh, it actually if we iterate FWI long enough to a thousand iterations, it will converge to the same result. Go wrong. Um, I, I, I want to jump in, I apologize. I just want to give you my version of why I think there's something happening. I don't think it has to do with gradient smoothing. I think, it, I think it has to do with the fact that the nature of the gradient itself changes as you do these modifications in the formula. Um, if you do conventional left of the UI, the, the gradient tends to make mistakes very quickly and for the, for the following reasons. There are two reasons. One is that it will want to create reflectors at the wrong locations to create a wave that provides a match of the data, but it's reflecting in the wrong location because the kinematics are wrong. Yep. And number two, it's going to want to tend to suppress the waves that already exist in the data set that it doesn't like by creating little lenses and, and wrong velocities that will scatter the waves off so that they are not, they, 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 they get canceled out at the level of the, of the, uh, of the, of the data. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happening with modification is that you're forcing the gradient to look like neither of those two bad options. What you're forcing your gradient to look like is a bunny ear transmission kernel or a banana donut kernel, a transmission kernel, because you are enforcing the changes to have to do with travel time changes. Yeah. So you're selecting the particular gradients that are favorable for velocity updates that are of this fashion here. Now, um, and incredibly, there are not too many of those kernels. Either they allow you to speed up the waves or slow them down, but the form of the kernel will be that, will be running your kernel or uh, your kernels. Yeah. And I guess we should draw them. <laughs> so those of you who know what I'm talking about do, those who don't, don't. Could you make the kernel? choice you have to make is whether you want to make it a delay or a time advance, yeah. plus or minus. 
And, well, this is perhaps a place where you really like it. Yeah. Sure. And, because um, you didn't quite ask for one versus the other. You have no principle to choose. You take a random, random ensemble and you hope that you'll end up having the right sign, whether positive or negative, but your your your, your graded update has the right shape for this a transition update. Yes, yes. I thank you so much for a geophysical application uh, <laughs> explanation. <laughs> but yeah. Related to that, I think, um, is the RSS a form of preconditioning and will play the role of preconditioning of the gradient? And uh, whether or not it is, I also are you using preconditioning in either case, okay. other than the implicit uh, RSS preconditioning? Um, because gradients are nasty things. Yeah. And it's nice. To yeah, nice to. Preconditioning. To, yeah. <laughs> well, there, there. If you remember my algorithm, there is a part I did say precondition yes. your gradient, and uh, and right. by that I did precondition the result of the gradient of these two the same way, like smoothing, masking, you know, putting things to you zero. Did. Yeah. I did. Um, the only difference is, I'm, am I shifting the wheel fields or not? That's, that's the only difference yeah. happening in, in. But then, how do I formulate my RSS as a preconditioning of the, well, yeah, this one, I, I really don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But you are, uh, but uh, maybe a better preconditioner could make that one like that. We tried. We tried all kinds of yeah. things. As I said, I thought that would be just a fancy smoother of the gradient, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be not. Yeah. Uh, Too long did you have? To both, but very, very small, like a, a square. Because <coughs> uh, the reason being, if I go back to the gradient, this is not. If I go back, uh, what you see is really because of the random shift, you you will get random randomness in the amplitude, and uh, and we know you know we smooth uh, FWI gradient all the time, so we just for a ca fair comparison, we just smooth both. And uh, well, I wouldn't talk about it, but uh, when we we also did it for least squares RTM for imaging, and uh, you will that shows up much more uh, predominantly in the RTM case. I can talk about it later with you guys. Okay, so let me go through the, the last example where uh, this is more <coughs> realistic uh, and we assume this is a long offset surface acquisition geometry but not nearly as long as, uh, as what people have been using in the field. So the offset is six kilometer long and the depth is 4.5 kilometers. Uh, usually people will say that if you are using diving weight for FWI, the, the depth that you can resolve is pretty much like one third of the off offset that you have. And given you have low frequency data. And again, the initial model is we assume we know the water bottom. So that's water velocity and below it's a half space. So we, again, we start from such a velocity model. Um, this is the result of we will form inversion starting to from the lowest frequency, which is 2 hertz in this case, 2, 5 hertz. And this is where I'm going to, you know, caution everyone who are working with field data that when you look at these two models, I, my students had a very hard time making judgment which one is better than, than the other. Because if you look at this, there are a lot of structures in that already. It seems the salt body is there. The canyon, the sedimentary canyon is there. So you can do a lot of interpretation already on this velocity model. Whereas on the right hand side, the predominant feature is that the low wave number update has been pushed down much deeper compared to this one. So say for example, if you look at this you know, patch of yellow, it has been pushed down like almost twice as deep as the other one. And But if you look at this model, you probably don't say, Oh, is this a better model than that? It's very hard to make the judgment. Which have the lower objective function? Well, they are, mm, that's a good question. This one would usually have a lower objective function initially. So it, it goes down much faster than this one. If you're getting the process, you have two models. Which one did better on the objective function? Oh, eventually this one does better. But then again, that's it's still 
staying at around maybe 50% of the objective function. So that's a low number, both of them. Mm. Yeah, you know, low it level of fitting. Well, yeah. yeah. So what we did, again, reinitialize conventional FWI using both models. That would test the kinematic information in both models. And uh, well, this is just a reminder. We are going to that block. OK, so I'm going to show you a few uh, slides in terms of iterations at 2 to 5 hertz again, starting from this model. And uh, maybe let's look at this model first. I will go to 100 iteration, 200 iteration. So what you see is this model doesn't really update much. Now I'm going to this model. If you look at it, I'm going backwards. That's 200 iteration for RSS, 100 iteration, and 1. So one more time, if, if you look at, focus on that, you will see dramatic structural change from iteration to iteration. And towards the end, the shape of the salt body, the top of salt, and this finger out there is so much better resolved compared with the conventional one. And again, we take this model and move on to higher frequency band, 2 to 7 hertz, 2 to 11 hertz, 2 to 15 hertz, and 19, and that's the end. So what you see is, well, this model <coughs> gets updated you know, over and over again, whereas this model update is really, really small. You know, the most of the structure are giving you information that makes you stuck in the local minimum. And uh, I would say the low wave number component is probably properly updated into three kilometer in depth. Below that, that's, there's also the artifact that you're seeing. Oh, by the way, the, the shift here is horizontal because we believe uh, most of the energy that we are trying to make use of is the diving wave, you know, the early arrivals. So we shift it in the horizontal. Maybe we should have used a strategy that we will shift in the vertical direction later in order to fit more of the reflections. But we didn't really do that. We didn't optimize. And I also want to point it out this thing here is an absolute artifact in the, in the model. That is simply because I have a very strong velocity here. And when you work with band-limited data, you always have side lobes. So although this canyon low velocity zone is real, this is artifact. So it's really difficult for you to make judgment when you work with field data what is artifact and what is, you know, geology. Okay, so, so that's about it. I showed you three synthetic examples. And by the way, for the last one, we did add some noise and uh, we did add, you know, uh, how do I call it? A variable density, whereas we invert it using acoustic wave equations. So it's not entirely inverse correct anymore. Um, okay, three examples with different geometry. And then why does it work? So it puzzles us, it works so well, it works for all kinds of geometries and it's, it seems to be extremely flexible. Um, I have a few speculations related to, you know, conventional methods that I've introduced before. I feel this is a type of model extension as well because it seems we are extending the model space but the, except that the extension is implicit and we had an immediate sub-addition, that means re model reduction at each time step or in each iteration. So we had an element of model extension you know, by, some, by uh, shifting the wheel field. And uh, secondly is we are effectively sampling a lot of the model space because we are changing the shift at each time step. So in terms of time step, we are probably using milliseconds. And uh, in terms of the frequencies in the wave field, that is thousands of times per wave or per wavelength or per period, then that means I'm actually sampling you know, a lot in the model space. And finally, stationary phase. So the idea is that when you shift your velocity model, you sample the velocity model, the best velocity model always gives you the strongest amplitude. Well, that's in imaging, that is in FWI. So by doing this, 
there is an automatic weighting towards the best model. So that goes in the stationary phase, then makes the gradient automatically better, uh, weighted better towards the good models. So these are my speculations. There's no proof of any of of any sort. If you are a mathematician and you are interested in working with us, um, why this works so well, please let me know. I'm extremely interested. Okay, so this is the conclusion. I want to emphasize because a common knowledge in, in the imaging area is that you can shift your real fields, but people often shift it in different, two different directions but that's only workable for backward scattering, and we have examples of that. For forward scattering, you have to shift the wheel fields in the same direction. That was a surprise. That came out as a surprise for us, but we have you know, some math to support that. Then the second conclusion is that this algorithm is really just as simple as it can be to improve FWI, and I encourage every one of you to try it out. And finally, I would like to put <laughs> this comment here and uh, take a step back and again saying this is not silver bullet. I'm sure there are so many places it can be improved. And, uh, but, uh, well, I hope maybe we either improve <laughs> this or prove it wrong. And, uh, but I'm, I'm open to discussions. Thank you. Two or three questions? Uh, yeah, so is there any like, relationship to the other extended domain uh, condition like TFWI? Like, usually, like, extended domain, you like scan the entire domain, yeah. and the, your case is basically you selected one yeah. and uh, randomly choose a different location. So, uh, I think there are some. There are, yeah, I agree with you. That's what I said on, on this slide, right? Um, it seems we are doing implicit yeah. extension of the yeah. model and then reducing it right away. So remember when I introduced, say, TFWI, you have to explicitly extend it such that your model space becomes huge. Then you have to design algorithms such that you can constrain that extended domain throughout iteration. And that that design is really tricky. Yeah, yeah. And I thought like you basically part up yourself the yeah. the model space yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, like uh, using like shrinking the bands then yeah. you are combining. Yeah, them. so we so are instead of scanning them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are we're just doing model reduction right away. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. In oh sorry. Oh, oh sorry. In your slow weight case. Yeah. Your conventional conversion generated a very complex looking model. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if. You took that as the actual model and then applied your algorithm trying to recover mm -hmm. that model. Mm -hmm. Do you think your algorithm would recover it or do you think it would go <laughs> back to the smoothie looking thing that you ah. had originally? That's a good question, but I thought my last example would uh, give you some indication yeah, towards yeah, that. Yeah. Right? So the last model is very you know, high width number, low width number combined. So I would say, uh, but I would say I think we can still produce that model with a strategy, but then I have to acknowledge that uh, the reason we only use the shift in the low frequency is because that we tend to produce smoother models. And if we do that too much in the high frequency, we lose resolution. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Have you tried to purposely use the wrong state so in the In that case, it yeah. does work. Yeah. That it sort of means that it's random sampling that's driving itself. And if it doesn't work, then it's because you're regularizing the grid. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Well, that's a good question. You know, when I gave a presentation, I don't give it in the order that we have did the work. <laughs> 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 that's that's the lesson I learned uh, when I did my internship with uh, Shell in the Netherlands. So my, my supervisor was saying, you don't have to show all these failures. <laughs> <laughs> you can just tell a successful story. And I was like, mm, that makes sense. <laughs> so what happened was that we started by shifting the wheel fields in the opposite direction always. And uh, it didn't turn out to be very useful. And uh, 
and then we started to see, you know, my postdoc started trying different things, and uh, and one day I was like, maybe let's look at a very simple model and see how you should be shifting the wheel field in order to approximate each other. So we, we just watch it over and over again, the movies, and we saw, yes, we should be shifting in the same direction if we are looking at transmission waves. And then we started the math derivation, which is very simplistic, as you can see. But yeah, the surprising part is for transmission, you do have to shift in the same direction. Otherwise, it won't work. For the reflection, you do have to shift in the opposite direction. Otherwise, it won't work. So there is a bit of physics behind this, and you cannot really do random because you will be adding noise, I think. Um, well, I think you see a bit of edge effects. You know, say for example in the in the reflection low velocity case, right? On the edge, there is certainly you know not sufficient sampling, and uh, yeah, I, I I would say well that's also related to the edge of geometry. Why am I not seeing? Well, usually my propagation grid is bigger than my model grid anyway because of the boundaries because. Of things like that. So maybe in terms of two lambda is still is still there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have one comment and one question. The comment is that, that I've seen I uh, seems like to me your model is compared to the more simple model, like the two simple models as the first one and second one. And your model for the third one actually is similar to the conventional model compared to the simple. So what I mean, like the Oh, you like mean it's not obvious? Yeah, you, I, you mean it's not obvious this is better? Yeah, <laughs> for the, the FWI conventional thing, like for the very simple models, they did a very, or much or more job. Yeah. compared to the more complex ones. Mm -hmm. But for this complicated one, it's very similar to the simple model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one comment. My, my question is that for the second model, the layer model, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned it briefly that you have to add a very uh, thin layer at the top, like low velocity layer, to make the method work. My question is that do you do the test that for both of the methods, and do they all feel if you do not add a layer? Yes. Well, the, the second question is easy. Yes, <laughs> it would all fail. But there are tricks you can play. Say I would just mute out all the updates in the, in, in the uh, near surface and, uh, and, and just underweight the data waiting at the uh, early time and, and near, so near offset. So there are, there are tricks you can play in order to do that uh, in terms of adding very thin layer on top. Um, so, so the question, the answer is yes to, to the second question. The first one though, that's again, you know, the tricky part, I want to say what's the, or, you know, the industry has been discussing as well, what is the goal of FWI? Is it getting a model that you can directly interpret and as accurate as possible, or is it a migration model that you can use to do imaging better? Um, maybe it's both, um, but in this case, again, I would say, yeah, you, you, ex you, you definitely have resolved features here, but for example, you have arti artifacts going on on top of there, and, and yeah, if, if you know the true geology, you will be able to interpret, right, this is a salt body, and there's a canyon, but um, that's kind of the dangerous part as well that I wanted to emphasize all along. Um, when you see colorful pictures and starting interpret faults on that, um, I I would be more careful than <laughs> than not. On that last question, Abby. So when you did the one-dimensional derivation, mm -hmm. what you call the shift actually also depended on the variable x. Yes. So did you consider to have not just a shift but a scaling and shifting? Yes, we did. And did, yeah. did that make a difference or not make it worse or you, you didn't show it so? Yeah, not quite, not quite much actually. So we did try, 
but it definitely makes sense, right? The longer you propagate and the more error you have, you should shift more. It's really intuitive. Um, and uh, we did try to do that, but it turned out to be not so critical because that means up shallow we would use a smaller shift and down deep we use a bigger shift. Yeah. Um, but then when it's in the transmission case, it's hard to really constrain that. So we ended up using one you know, bound of this uniform distribution that we are sampling all together. So that turned out to be not too, too, you know, too much, not causing too much differences. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's thank you again. Yep, I will be around.